So I guess um, I'll throw this question to Dr. Basic and Dr. Navia first. Um, you know, how has the fact that Cleveland Clinic is now a global healthcare system, um, you know, how has that imp impacted care coordination? I mean, not just inside of a single state, but, but how, how, did, how do you coordinate care across uh, multiple states, you know, from Florida to Ohio or even globally? Um, how, how has uh, our care coordination been impacted? Um, so, I don't know if Dr. Chap is here, but um, with maternal fetal medicine, the, um, yeah, yeah it's, it's an evolution. I mean, the venture down to, to Florida is, is just starting. Um, I mean, I can speak here regionally that as, as a practice, we are really working on um, the standardization of, of practices within our own division, as well as, you know, cross uh, divisions with, you know, Dr. Cass and, and the fetal, you know, surgery team. Um, I expect that this will continue as the group evolves down uh, in the Florida region, as well as elsewhere throughout the country. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question. Uh, we've been working with uh, Dr. Hani um, in terms to, to provide uh, the congenital service here in, uh, in Florida. As you know, we don't have pediatric in Western. Uh, we have the pediatrics in, um, in um, Martin House in the river. So we're going to try to find a way to um, bring some uh, of the expertise from Ohio to initially start working with the congenital, other congenital surgery, and then moving forward with the uh, with expectation. I think uh, there's a possibility here in, in Florida to have this uh, pediatric congenital surgery. No question about it. It's going to take time for sure, but uh, that's our goal. Yeah, I look forward to that. Um, you know, the other thing I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Ehrenberg, you know, um, it has been, uh, I think, significant that we now have uh, maternal fetal medicine from Ohio helping support a lot of our regional hospitals here in Florida. And I guess the same question would go to you. Um, how do you see, um, you know, uh, your level of, 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 of field cardiology and, and childhood cardiology being able to support um, our, our primary care practices in Florida? Yeah, so I think that that's a great question, and it sort of highlights um, what we've been talking about all morning, that this is a sort of group and integrated type of approach, and you start with one service like the maternal fetal medicine, and obviously you want to grow and expand it into everything that follows from it, so linking in fetal um, echocardiography, and then once you identify the children, then we're going to want to be able to take care of them as a pediatric cardiologist as well, as well as figuring out sort of how to do the surgery surgery and those kind of things. So I think it's going to be a process and, and one that we hope that we can get involved in. Certainly, I think the level that we're at right now is that we would be absolutely sort of, <coughs> excuse me, at the ready to provide sort of um, you know, video consultation on a peer-to-peer -peer basis for sure and, you know, would, would welcome anybody from down in your area who wants to call us up or do, you know, a Microsoft Teams meeting where we just can talk about any patients. And then obviously over time, I hope that it can evolve into something where we can uh, have someone down there or go down there the way that Dr. Chapa is on a, you know, sort of not sure what basis right now, but obviously that's what we hope to do. And I think it's, as we've said before, you can't, you know, start to do one thing without needing the rest of the team. So as Dr. Phillips goes and sort of starts to build that, obviously there's going to be other team members needed. And so we look forward to being uh, able to be part of it, but don't know exactly what it'll look like right now. Yeah, yeah I just no, want to comment. Go Sorry, Sonia. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that now Today, we have adults uh, with congenital heart disease more than pediatrics with congenital heart disease. And it's going to get, it's, it's probably the, the most evolving subspecialty because the, the better we get at pediatrics to get them to survive to beyond age of 18, the more you're going to see them in your day-to-day -day practice. So you're going to continue to see them whether uh, you are in the field of cardiology or cardiac surgery or you're not, you're a surgeon, you're a 
a, a, an obstetrician, you're say, seeing them for uh, uh, medicine, for all the other subspecialty. So these are a growing population that we have to continue to educate the general practitioners about them because they are, not, they are unique. Specifically, I'm talking about the univentricular hearts, but even the biventricular hearts who, who've had uh, uh, multiple operations. I'm sure Jose would t tell you how many times he gets referred a fifth yep. and sixth time redo on an aortic valve that has to be replaced after starting the first operation, maybe in year two or three, and then they end up showing up in his practice with multiple operations. So I think, well, what we need to really hone down on those patients uh, with adults and congenital heart disease because they're a growing population. They're gonna continue to grow the more we do better with pediatric congenital heart. Yeah, I agree. Actually, I'll be, I'll be talking later today, um, you know, about, uh, you know, the fact that we do have a lot more maternal patients that have, that are, you know, have uh, grown up with congenital heart disease and, Sorry. and it is a growing, it is a growing patient population. And I look forward to further collaboration, you know, especially because I do think video uh, consulting and making sure that we're, you know, getting the patients to the best facility to get the best outcomes. Yeah. So. Um, I didn't have any questions come up in the uh, chat box. We Is do have one that showed any? up. Okay. From Sharon Abraham. How often does the team at Cleveland Clinic utilize 3D printing of the heart? And what times of cases would this be used for? That question. Uh, so this is really uh, dear to my heart, 3D printing. Um, for us, we've been uh, using for the last few years, actually, uh, 3D printing for complex hearts. And uh, what I found, not for the regular anatomy, for those patients whom I'm gonna share with you in my last talk, what's called an unsubtable heart. These are the hearts who have been deemed uh, unsubtable and they're routed into a univentricular heart because they're too complex on the inside of the heart that surgeons before decided, you know what, let's just leave that, deal with it as one single ventricle and leave that other extra ventricle because we cannot actually separate these two circulations. So what we did in the last few years, and we've really put in an operation that we've actually termed ventricular switch, and I will uh, talk to you a little bit about it. So we know about the atrial switch, we know about the arterial switch, but the birth of ventricular switch is here at the Cleveland Clinic. And that is based on what we have been doing with the 3D printing, because we've been able to uh, septate or divide the two circulation of what's called, we used to be called an unsubtatable heart. Well, I'll share with you very briefly though on this, and I think 3D printing is, uh, is important in complex lesions, and it does not, and it's not replaced by uh, uh, virtual imaging that has been also proposed. It's uh, it, to me as a surgeon, holding the heart in my hand uh, means a lot to me. If I could actually open up the chambers of the heart and decide how I'm gonna reroute the circulation from within inside, rather than just looking at 2D images, even though if it's 3D with, with, with the glasses. Were there any other questions submitted? I think we have, I think we have time for one more from uh, Pamela. Is termination performed by C-section or vaginal evacuation versus medication? Um, typically, uh, it, the procedure is. Uh, you know, I guess the question. I guess the question I would have is: is she referring to specifically the WHO class for um, you know women? I mean, uh, termination can be performed either through uh, medication or uh, uterine evacuation. But in that uh, particular high-risk uh, group of women, uh, surgical uh, or uterine evacuation is preferred. Thank you.
right. Well, it looks like if I can make, we're about I can it. make one comment. If I can make one comment, just as just regarding fetal therapy, I, and this addresses uh, Dr. Peace's earlier question. I think we want we want to provide the very best care at the very best location that's convenient for the family and all the care team. So, and I think it's going to depend on what the conditions are. Perhaps the complexity of the condition, the complexity of the network of providers that need to provide that care, and where the family is located. Um, and for example, things like treating twin twin transfusion, the, comp the instrumentation in the team is pretty small, and that could be a therapy we could provide regionally. But uh, some other, you know, tr a lung lesion that inf involves an experienced team, including cardiology, working together and seeing multiple patients in a very low incidence problem probably is probably more of a regional type intervention. And I think, but I think the first thing is we have to all get to know each other, communicate with each other. The virtual platform is awesome. Find out our strengths, weaknesses, and assets and then figure out how to best allocate those across a big region of the world, I hope. 